Good morning, everybody. I think today is the officially the first sniffle day of the fall. You can tell everybody's coming. It's just cold enough for everybody's like. It's okay. It's been a nice fall. We'll take it. Um, we're going to start off. I guess I should mention. I think all of you guys are aware of this. Uh, the assignments due today. So. Uh, if you haven't done that and you haven't uploaded it and you can't do it in the next hour and 15 minutes because you don't have a computer here, you better like leave and go do it now because it has to be uploaded by 9.15. So, um, so those will be uh, graded, uh, I don't know, we usually I have three or four TAs for this class. This year I have one. So um, he's going to get worked really hard. And I'm hoping we'll have them done in about a week. So I'm hoping by next Tuesday. So, but the next assignment is based on this one. So, uh, I mean, you can start it, but if you're confident in what you uploaded, but basically what we're going to do now, or what Jonathan's going to do is go through and make sure everybody uploaded the right stuff, did the right uh, inputs, everything, so that you can go on and do the second uh, assignment. Because if you did it, this part wrong, then you can't move on. So that's basically what this part uh, is going to do. So we'll let you guys all know that as soon as possible. Also, uh, we have an exam coming up a week from Thursday. And uh, this Thursday, um, I will go over some just kind of logistics of the exam. Maybe uh, I'll go over some example questions, uh, that type of stuff, you know. So what the exam will cover, uh, that, that type of information. OK, so with that, we will get started. Any questions on the exam, upcoming exam, or anything in general? No? All good? All right, so this is where we left off last time. And we were talking about um, fiber, okay? And um, I just kind of want to point out, we talked about two, uh, multiple classes of fiber, but two important ones are, are soluble and insoluble. Okay, and you see these back of food labels as well. And where these come from. So most of the, um, if you take a fruit, for example, an apple is a really good example. The cellulose, which is the indigestible stuff, is the skin, okay? Because if you think about this, this skin part, you could throw it in water and it's never going to dissolve in there, right? It's, it's almost the same as, uh, you know, uh, well, it is cellulose, so it's something very structural. Whereas the inside of the apple has something we call pectin, which is a soluble fiber, and this is actually um, really good. It's, this actually is what feeds your gut microbiota. They love this stuff, okay? If you look at a grain, so we talk, uh, we'll spend more time talking about this, but whole grains we hear about all the time, right? Why whole grains are good. Um, we'll talk what that is. But if you take the outside coating of a grain, whatever it may be, a wheat, oat, barley, um, most of the fiber in that grain is on these very outside layers, the bran layers, okay? And this is primarily insoluble fiber. Okay, there's very little soluble fiber in most uh, of these types of grains, at least on the outside. Okay? The inside can have some soluble fiber, and we'll talk more about that. But just to give you examples of where these things are. So this is the same with all plants. If you think about the stalks or the leaves, most of that is insoluble fiber. Okay, so some of the benefits of this, and I want to spend a, a little time, even though this is a small font on here, I think it's, there's some important points on here. Um, and again, going back to examples of where you see some of these soluble fibers in fruits, oats is the hallmark one, um, barley, other grains, and other legumes, things like uh, lentils and um, uh, chickpeas and, and various things like that, beans. Um, some of the health benefits, and this, this is the one I want to point out. Again, it's in small font, but it's a very, very important point, is this first, the, the three of them right here, but especially the first one. Um, is it lowers blood cholesterol. So if you remember when we talked about health claims and I showed you the box of Cheerios, and it says right on that box of Cheerios that you know eating a diet with insoluble fiber and what exercise and other good things in your diet can lower your cholesterol and reduce the risk of heart disease or whatever it said. Um, this is exactly based on this claim. So we've known that the insoluble fiber actually slows down cholesterol or impairs cholesterol absorption. And this goes back to the example I told you when we eat, if you take a bowl of oatmeal and you make it, it gets all thick and gooey and viscous, right? Well, it's the same thing that happens in your gut. So if you, if you could imagine taking like a, a cylinder of oatmeal, okay, and cooking it, and then trying to pour something through it, it's not going to move very fast, right? It's just kind of sit on top. 
Or if you did something like an insoluble fiber, let's say you took celery and ground it up and put it in the cylinder. Water or something could still get through there, right? Because you have insoluble things and it's going to go around. So the benefit of this is it traps, because it's so slow and so viscous, it traps the cholesterol in kind of the matrix of the food and it slows it down and it, it keeps it um, in the gut rather than being absorbed. Okay, so that's why. And a lot of studies show if you have a diet with a fair amount of like Oprah or things like this, you can lower cholesterol maybe 10, 20%. So for some people, this is, this is important. Okay, so that's one of the big benefits of soluble fiber. Um, the other one, it, and it kind of ties with this, is it delays gastric emptying. It basically slows down which food goes through your tract. Okay, and this can be a good thing. It helps you feel fuller, potentially, um, which is a good thing. And along with that, the third point is it decreases blood glucose. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, um, this whole concept of, um, of uh, glucose loads and, and glycemia. And what this implies is that when we eat, let's say you go and you eat uh, something really high in starch or, or some sugar or whatever it may be, okay, and an empty stomach. Basically, that comes in and it gets absorbed really fast and your blood glucose spikes up, right, and then comes down. Um, and what this is going to do is it slows that peak. And we think that's a very good thing. We try and avoid peaks of glucose and insulin, which we'll talk about, because those can cause, uh, in the long run, more hunger, more complications um, in the body. So by slowing the rate at which that glucose is absorbed is actually a, a very good thing. And the fourth one, which I will put in here, and the book doesn't have, because anytime they make a book, it's basically outdated the day they publish it, is, as I mentioned, it's, it's food. I'm going to put food for bugs, okay? It's food for the gut microbiota. It's food for your gut bacteria. Okay? This is what they thrive off of. They love soluble fiber because most of this is, is not digestible to us, but it gets to them and they go nuts on it. This is what keeps them happy and healthy. And it keeps you having a good population of the good bacteria in your gut. So that's a soluble fiber. And there's, there's probably many other health benefits as well, but these are probably the most characterized, most well-known. All right? So the insoluble fibers down below, and these, again, are examples. You think of, you know, the celery is always the one that pops into your mind. Um, it's lots of fiber. Um, whole grain, grains, as I mentioned. Skins of fruits and vegetables. Um, whole grain uh, things. Seeds are often very high in insoluble fiber as well. And what is the health benefits of insoluble fiber? Um, a little bit like the soluble fiber, it, it decreases uh, intestinal transit time, so it slows things down going through your gut, keeps you fuller, okay, rather than um, just emptying out. It's very good for keeping you regular, I would say, okay, so preventing constipation, diarrhea, it keeps the basically the GI tract healthy. Um, we'll talk about this in a minute. It lowers the risk for some diseases of your GI tract, okay, specifically uh, diverticulitis, which is, uh, again, I'll talk about this in a few seconds. And people have also realized, too, that the more insoluble fiber you have, the more, uh, less likelihood you are of developing colon cancer, which is a pretty big deal. I think, in, I think after lung cancer, I think colon cancer is um, number two killer in men, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. So um, it's a big deal. And as you would imagine, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but most Americans don't get anywhere near the fiber requirements they are supposed to. So these are the general benefits of the two different um, classes of fiber that we talked about. Okay, now we're going to talk about sweeteners a little bit. And most of the sweeteners, uh, we talked about monosaccharides, the very simplest sugars. And we talked about disaccharides. Well, most of the sweeteners are in one of these two forms, um, either, either the single or double, okay? The most common one uh, is table sugar, okay? And um, one we've seen pop up in the last uh, 50 years is high fructose corn syrup, okay? Most of the sugar, if you look before high fructose corn syrup, and we'll get into this in a little bit, um, was typically derived from either cane, so sugar cane or sugar beets, okay? And you can see that these have tapered off over the last uh, 50 years, basically, and they're probably continuing to go down, okay? But then you can see back here in the 1970s, all of a sudden high fructose corn syrup started creeping up, all right? 
And then there's some other things like uh, syrups, honey, various things. But those are pretty minor in the grand scheme of where we get our sweeteners from. And this is important too because if you look at just about any packaged food, it's hard to find a packaged food without some sort of sweetener in it, right? Pretty much everything has something in it. And you and actually, there's I think I saw a drinking game one time where they you had to if you had something with you that didn't have a corn product in it, you had to drink type of thing. Because almost every ingredient label has some derivative of corn, right? Corn syrup, corn sugar, corn this, corn that. And then um, we'll also talk about, or we, there's also sugar alcohols, I should mention. So these, not a big deal. Um, these, you see these in um, like sugarless gum. This is the common one you see it in, or sugarless breath mints, things like this. Okay? You do get some energy from this, but it's, it's pretty trivial. But you can see the dynamics of how not only the sweeteners that we're consuming more, but also of where they're coming from. So that leads us to a question of the day. All right. So it says, I had a question about high fructose corn syrup. I've always heard very contrasting opinions about its health effects. And I was wondering if there's, any, if there's been any concrete research, and that's really the key here, that has helped prove one side over the other. So this is a really, in nutrition, the worst thing anybody can do if you're in nutrition, like you sit down in an airplane and the person next to you asks what you do, and you say you're a professor in nutrition, stupidest thing you can ever do, okay? Tell them you're a proctologist or something, then they'll leave you alone. But you tell them you're in nutrition, and they immediately, oh, high fructose corn syrup, what do you think about that? Or what do you think about this diet? Um, this one is usually the top of the question list, okay? Um, I'm curious, you know, you guys hear about this all the time in the media, I'm sure you see foods, all that. What is the general thoughts of people about high fructose corn syrup? This, does this elicit a negative response? Is it like, eh, it's just a sweetener? What do people think about this? Does anybody have any? Yeah. Like, maybe try to avoid it, but I don't know why. Like, okay. I have heard it's bad, so I try to avoid it. Okay, so you avoid it. Not 100% sure why. I think that's a very logical and common response to people because it's been villainized to a lot in the, in the media, for sure. Um, undoubtedly. Um, anybody else have any thoughts or comments? So. Um, First of all, I think we, we need to, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this. I think we need to back up and talk about how fructose corn syrup came to be to begin with, okay? So as I showed you back in the graph here, back in the, the, the before 1970s, you really never saw high fructose corn syrup in anything, okay? And most of the sweeteners we got were from sugar cane and sugar beets. And some, some scientists in Japan back in the 70s figured out some reaction, some enzymatic reaction, where they could take starch. Remember, starch is just a bunch of glucoses put together, a bunch of sugars put together. And they could convert it very, very cheaply is the key into high fructose corn syrup, okay? And by doing this, um, they could, it was essentially cheaper to make high fructose corn syrup from corn starch than it was to process the sugar cane or sugar beets. Okay, so now you have a very economical source of a sweetener. Well, again, I'm from Iowa, right? We have a little bit of corn in Iowa. And so all of a sudden you have this avenue of where you have a source, you have a product, you have lots of corn, you have a way of converting it into sugar very cheaply. So if you're a food company and all of a sudden you can make your product a little bit sweeter, which we know people like, maybe cheaper, are you going to do it? You're going to sell, if you, I mean, your ultimate goal of the company is to make money, right? So you're going to sell more of your food if people like it. So this is part what driven. The other thing that drove this is to keep corn prices down. This, this really goes back, and we, this could be a whole um, another lecture. But back in the 70s, the U.S. had a secretary of agriculture by the name of Butts. I don't remember his first name. I just remember Butts. Um, but he basically developed what kind of we have as a current farm bill. And the way the current farm bill works is uh, products like corn are fairly highly subsidized by the government, okay? So in other words, corn prices are always going to stay somewhat lower or cheaper than some other commodities. And as a result, you had this time here where you had this new way of converting cornstarch into, into a sweetener. You had low corn prices, which has been driven by the government. And so... This drove why you start seeing more and more corn syrup or high fructose corn syrup in products. Because it's, um, for the companies, 
it's a cheap source and we know people like it. And that's what drove it. So that's kind of how it came to be. And that's why you see it in just about everything. Um, now, going back to the question itself, the health effects. Does anybody know what uh, high fructose corn syrup is made of? What the composition is? Well, I'll give you a hint. Okay, so high fructose corn syrup is, there, there's, it's called high fructose corn syrup. There's actually many types of levels of fructose in it, but the most common one is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. Okay. Does this look like close to anything we talked about in this class? What is made of 50-50 of each of these? Do you remember? Sucrose, that's right. So t simple table sugar. So if you look at sugar beet or sugar cane sugar, which is pretty much all sucrose. So that is 50% fructose and 50% glucose. Okay. Now the one difference in these is in sucrose, if you remember, these two are joined together by a bond and we have to break that. Okay. So these are actually, and sucrose is a disaccharide, so these are linked together. High fructose corn syrup, these are individual monosaccharides, okay? And this is a proportion. So if you look at it purely from a chemical standpoint, is 5% more fructose really a big deal? Probably not, okay? Probably not. There are some people that would argue that because these are monosaccharides, maybe they're digested and absorbed faster, and that influences things. I haven't really seen any concrete information on this. Um, most of the studies, and they're, they're, <laughs> this gets tricky because a lot of the studies that have looked at this have been funded by like companies like PepsiCo and places like this that actually you know invest in the cor high fructose corn syrup is a big deal for them or, or corn manufacturers. So you have to kind of take some of these with a grain of salt. But most of the real good studies that have actually compared these two head to head show really no difference between the two. Okay, no real difference. So this is, I think this is an important question, but this also goes back, okay, now we're comparing one sugar versus the other. And one could go back and argue, well, maybe another question we should be asking is simply sugar versus no sugar. And as, as many of you guys have probably heard over the last, um, I don't know, five years or so, there's been a big... Um, outlash on sugar. Okay, sugar is the new heathen, right? It's the demon that's killing us all. Um, we went through this with fat in the 1980s. Fat, everything was low fat. You, you know, that, that's what the craze was. Now we, we, um, we think sugar is the villain. And this is, a, um, this is an article, an editorial that got a lot of publicity from the New York Times back in 2011. It says, is sugar toxic? Okay, and just the use of the term toxic obviously evokes a lot of, you know, you think of rat poison or something like this, right? Um, and so, but it, it brings up some interesting points, um, and, and what he's trying to get across here is that we eat a lot of sugar, okay? There's no doubt about that. Um, some teenagers eat 20, 30 plus percent of their calories from sugar, okay? The average American is maybe between 10 and 20 percent of their calories are from sugar. And so, is this too much? That's, that's really the question. Um, I mean, he goes in there and he basically says that all, all evils that happen to us is because of sugar. And I think that's completely wrong because it's like anything, um, it's a dose, right? A little bit of sugar, is it going to kill you? No. Okay. If you drink a two liter of Coke every day, probably not a good idea in the long run, right? Okay. So um, the, the take home point from all of this is I think too much sugar in the diet is, is bad, especially chronically. I mean, if you go out and gorge on something for a day, again, it's not going to hurt you, but chronic high levels. And only the study, the studies now are really just starting to come out where they've done really good studies where they compare different doses. A lot of the studies have been done and they do this really crazy like doses of stuff that no one would ever eat. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't it's not really relevant. So most of the studies now looking in the range, we eat 10, 15, 20% of our calories of sugar 
are starting to suggest that, yeah, when you get to that upper spectrum, maybe 15, 20%, it starts doing things to your body that you don't want. It may increase your risk of cancer, it may increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, things like this. But if you're just eating, you know, some people are very anti-fruit because fruit has sugar in it. I think that's insane, okay? I think it's absolutely nuts. And um, anyway, but, but you know what? When you say something is something toxic, you get a lot of attention and there's, uh, you see a lot of this in the media. And as a result of this, um, the companies that make high fructose corn syrup have responded. And so this is a website called Sweet Surprise. And it's sponsored by, I believe, the corn industry. And it talks about basically what they're, they're trying to basically disregard some of the, the negative coverage that um, high fructose corn syrup has got. And they talk about high fructose corn syrup is nearly identical in composition to sugar and all of these things. And, and many of these points are completely valid. Um, there's still concerns, um, obviously, about it. But um, anyway, that's kind of where we stand. So with that, we're going to play a game today. I don't have prizes, sorry. But um, just to give you guys a little idea about sugar, because a lot of foods contain a lot more sugar than one would think. So I found this website that actually does some comparisons between um, certain foods. And we won't go through them all, but um, I think a few of these are important. So um, we're going to do this old school. I could have the clickers, but it's more exercise. Raise your arms, just a little stretching, blood flowing a little bit. All right, so yogurt versus granola. Which one has more sugar? Yogurt. Wow, anti-yogurt crowd. Granola. OK. What do we got? Yogurt. All right. Um, two teaspoons of, of uh, sugar. So teaspoons of the, you know, the cubes, that's a teaspoon, to give you guys a reference. The little sugar cubes, that's a teaspoon. Uh, granola bar, typically I have two, but again, this varies in the granola bar. But a lot of the non-fat yogurt. So when people first made yogurt, it's nothing like we see now, OK? They, the reason you made yogurt is because the bacteria fermented the sugars into something else. And now, all the stuff we make, is there's no fat in it. There should be fat in yogurt, OK? And they take the fat out, and they add sugar and fruity stuff to make you like it, because we like sweet stuff. Okay, so it's totally different. Everybody's ever been to Europe and eaten the yogurt there? Completely different than what's over here. Okay? So yogurt is actually a chock, chock full of it. Even, you know, there's a lot of uh, interest now in the Greek yogurt, which has higher protein, which, um, you know, may be good. But um, even a lot of that has a lot of sugar in it. So this is a, a common one that, where it hides. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't health benefits of eating yogurt with calcium and all sorts of other nutrients. But um, regarding sugar, there is some there. Um, peanut butter crackers versus corn. I don't care about that one. We'll skip that one. It's peanut butter crackers, just in case you're dying to know. OK, soda versus uh, a sweetened coffee drink. Soda. This is unsweetened soda, or a sweetened soda, obviously. Uh, coffee. OK, so this one's tricky, because um, the coffee, some people's version of sweetening is a little bit. Some version of sweetening is like half syrup, half coffee. Um, so the answer to this is the soda. So a can of soda is 15 teaspoons of sugar. Okay? It's all the calories you get in there is sugar. Okay? It's like a, you might as well just run an IV line in. Um, whereas a coffee, is, a, a coffee is, again, 12 teaspoons. But again, that depends on the person. But a lot of this is a source of. I think I saw, I saw a study out here a couple of years ago where they were looking at where people were getting sugar from that they had no clue. And coffee was a big one, because a lot of people put sweeteners in there. They go to Starbucks, and they get the, I'm not a coffee drinker, but the, whatever, the cappuccino this, or latte that, or whatever, with all sorts of sweet and good stuff. It's not like bitter old black coffee, OK? And so that is uh, another source that people um, often forget. But soda is undoubtedly a, a villain. A bagel or a fortune cookie? Bagel. Fortune cookie. Actually, your fortunes are wrong. It's a fortune cookie, three teaspoons, compared to a large bag. And now, having said that, bagels still have a, a I mean, they're all carbs, right? Um, and all of that carbs will get broken down into glucose or sugar. So this one's kind of a little bit tricky. Plus, you get a fortune, which is cool. So that should outweigh. Hopefully, it, hopefully it's a good fortune. I don't know. If it's bad, then maybe eat the bagel. 
Um, fish sticks and peanut butter. I have no idea who made this comparison. It's not two things I would generally compare when it comes to sugar, but um, we won't vote because this one I saw, it's, it's a tie. Neither one has much. Uh, peanut butter has a little bit. Obviously, peanut butter is packed with protein, very fi lots of fiber, it's good stuff. Um, fish sticks, most of it there is obviously in the breading. So people, there, there's more um, sugar hidden in breading than people realize. Here we go. Glazed chocolate donut or chocolate chip cookie? Both major health foods. All right, donut. Cookie. It's the donut. Eight teaspoons versus seven. Come on. Really? So those people that voted for the chocolate chip cookie, you weren't, you weren't too far off. Are there Krispy Kremes around here? Have you guys seen any? I used to live in North Carolina, and were, that's where Krispy Kreme started, and they were everywhere. And those, I, I can't imagine, had probably about double of the sugar in these. I had a heart attack just looking at them. OK. Um, caramel corn versus a fruit smoothie. Corn. Caramel corn, not regular popcorn. Smoothie. You guys are on it today. Each has 12 teaspoons. So not far from, far, not far from a can of soda. Okay? The smoothies are, you see these popping up all over the smoothie places, right? It's healthy, it's got lots of fruit in it. That's true. But most of them are pretty laden with sugar, too. They, they like to hide in there. And obviously, regular popcorn is much lower, but when you coat it with sugar and caramel, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. What else we got? Beans and bologna? I don't care. <laughs> Um, barbecue sauce versus worst, uh, wor wor I can never say that, the other sauce, okay? What are we saying? Um, the W sauce? <laughs> barbecue sauce, yeah. Uh, both have a half a teaspoon. Wow, I was wrong on this. I was surprised. I thought this barbecue would have more. Barbecue, I'm really surprised by this. The one that, along with this, a condiment, though, that, that hides a lot is ketchup. People don't realize that there is a ton of sugar in ketchup. It's one of the top ingredients in ketchup. So anyway, that's our, our fun um, game for the day. Again, I don't have prizes, sorry. So any, uh, before we move on from the high fructose corn syrup, any questions or comments about this? I know this is something you guys hear about. Now, hopefully I gave you some science-based information that is actually um, factual about this. Yeah? So, yeah, absolutely. So you're talking about like a smoothie, for example, if it's just fruit-based versus the added sugar, is that what you mean? Yeah, absolutely, no doubt. And this is actually something, when I talk about food labels, one of the things they proposed, it hasn't been approved yet, just this summer, they proposed to put on new food labels, added sugar, both total sugar and added sugar, to give people an idea of how much is coming naturally from that food or how much is coming just being dumped in on top, which I think is, will be an interesting thing to see how that shakes out. But yes, and this, this is true for pretty much anything. And you know, I'll come back to this in a slide here, coming back to that comment, because I'm going to show something. Yeah. Uh, sugar from the CV plant? This is uh, the... Um, Is that the is that the guava stuff? It's like Truvia. Truvia. I don't remember. I, I, you know, I've heard of it, but I don't. There's some. Um, was it agave nectar? That's not the same thing, is it? No. Agave nectar is like uh, almost pure fructose. It's like 80, 90 percent fructose. Which will I mean we'll talk about that in a minute. The reason it, it's super sweet. So fructose is sweeter than glucose. Okay. So that's. Um, Maybe why people like it super sweet. I don't. I don't know. I, I haven't looked it up. So, any other questions or comments? Yeah, please. Um, 
I, I can't think of a place where it'd be natural. It's always added as far as, because it's, the way you make it is a, really an artificial process. You don't find it in nature. So um, it's always an added sugar, okay? I love too when you look on a food label and they have, you know, they have, they, they list, you know, the ingredients in order, but they have high fructose corn syrup and then they have sh corn sugar and other sugar. It's like, how many types of sugar do you need to make this? Can't you just put a crap load of one thing in? But they, they like to spin it in different ways. I don't know if it's a marketing thing so people don't realize um, how many different types of sugar in or what. I don't know. But anyway, any other questions or comments? Okay. So this is a common one. So uh, going back to our little sugar game here, uh, equal size, I, I don't know what these are, 20 ounce or 16 ounce, uh, orange juice versus Coke, okay? Which has more calories? How many say Coke? How many say orange juice? How many say don't know or maybe they're the same? So they're equal. And this is a, another very common source of sugar in people's diet is fruit juice, okay? We always think, you know, a kid, oh, have a glass of juice or adult, I guess. doesn't matter. Um, now, from a nutrient standpoint, obviously, if you're drinking this, you're going to get a lot more. You're getting nothing here. You're getting sugar. You're going to hear, at least you're getting some vitamin C and other things, right? But if you're doing it simply on a, a calorie basis, they're the same. It's the same on all sugar. So I guess the point is, is when, um, which I try and harp um, to people, is if you have the option, eat the fruit, right? The fruit's going to give you fiber. It's going to give you lots of other things. The juice is going to take, unless it's really high pulp, but it's going to take a lot of the fiber out and just concentrate the sugar. So you still get the vitamins, but you're going to lose some of those nutrients. Yeah, there's a question coming over. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Same amount, like uh, whatever, 16 ounces or whatever it is. Yeah. Oh, and here's just some other ones to give you guys some ideas. Um, you can see the, the Coke. Red Bull energy drinks, man, these are the bomb. Um, uh, uh, very popular right now. Um, lemonade, Oreos, I don't care about it. I still like them. Um, ice cream versus uh, sorbet. Look at that. Isn't that scary? It's like, oh, that's depressing. Um, some fruits, grapes, apples. Uh, we don't have bananas on here, but actually bananas are uh, pretty high in sugar too. Actually one of the more sweeter fruits, even though they don't taste as sweet. But again, you have to realize what you're getting with it. These are just sugar. Here you're getting fiber. Here you're getting all sorts of uh, vitamins, minerals, all sorts of other nutrients. So again, this is back to this concept of empty calories. Okay, so alternate sweeteners, okay? And the point of alternate sweeteners is to basically cut back on calories. So these will hopefully, some of them you get calories from, but you use less of it because it's so sweet. Um, so compared to a regular sugar, um, there'll be less calories coming in. So the two um, most common uh, that I'm going to talk about are uh, saccharin. So saccharin, I believe, is the sweet and low brand that you guys see. Um, and this one's been around for a while, okay? And um, you can't cook with this, okay? If you cook it, it gets bitter, so you can't put it in, in processed foods that get cooked. And this one has no energy whatsoever. Okay? So it is completely, um, well, no energy. And the second one is aspartame. And this one also cannot be used in cooking um, because it breaks down. So different reasons. First one's bitter taste. This one breaks down. Um, this one is very widely used. It's, uh, what is the name? I think I have it on the next slide. Um, equal um, is the one you see for this one. And this one contains phenylalanine, which is an amino acid, which we, we won't talk so much, but people, there's a disease called PKU. Um, that involves amino acid metabolism. If you have this disease, this can be very, very bad um, because you can't metabolize it. Um, but this one, you do get calories, but again, you use a lot, lot less. So at the net end of the day, when you use this, you're only using a little bit. So the amount of calories you're getting is, is pretty low compared to if you used table sugar. And this one is used in a lot of stuff. This is a big one uh, in most sodas. Um, so many drinks, or so many things have artificial sweeteners in. There's also many others too. 
And this just gives you guys a little bit of an idea of um, this is their relative sweetness. So if you take each of these and you put equal amounts on your tongue, a little drop of each of these on your tongue, this is how, um, how sweet it would taste to you. Okay? And so you can see here, for example, let's start in the very lowest here. So lactose. Lactose is milk sugar, right? When you drink milk, does it taste sweet? Generally not, even though there's a fair amount of sugar in milk. Okay? It doesn't have fructose, though. It's, it's glucose and galactose, and you don't even see galactose on here. Okay? Um, galactose doesn't really taste sweet. Um, and then we go up, we have glucose, sucrose, which we talked about, a simple table sugar, so that's one, that's our reference value here. Okay? Then if you look at just simple fructose, you can see it's higher. So that's um, why perhaps the, the high fructose corn syrup is used, because your tongue can then sense that fructose and it tastes sweeter. And then if we looked at the sugar alcohols, these are the guys that are in sugarless gum. Um, not that sweet, but you don't get much for calories from them. And then we look at the ones over here that are found in all sorts of things. So we just talked about um, the equal or aspartame. It's about 200 times sweeter than um, table sugar, sucrose. Okay, saccharin, 300, and then some of these newer ones, neotame, sucralase, I hate this crap. Um, it's like 600 times. I can't drink this. I don't know what it is. It just makes me want to vomit. It's some, something in reaction to my mouth. I don't know. Um, and then some of these other ones, super sweet. Okay, so you can use tiny amounts of them, and um, as a result, you need less sugars in your diet. So recommended carbohydrate intake, okay? These are recommended, they're not requirements. Is roughly 130 grams of carbs per day. Okay, so this should be roughly half your energy requirements is what, it's probably what most people eat, but it's also what the general recommendations are. And, and the best is to limit added sugars. Now, there's no um, limit to this currently from the DRIs, um, but I think there's a lot of discussion about this. There's certain um, governing bodies. I think the Heart Association in some places have said, okay, we need to start limiting the amount of sugars people are getting. A big one is a fiber of how much people should get. And you can see the values here. I do not, just for your reference, I do not ask actual grams of something or anything like that on the exam. This is more for your reference. But 25 grams of fiber, and I would imagine that if you guys go in and you look on your, um, your diet assessment thing, you look at your food logs, I would bet the vast majority of the class is not meeting your requirements. Okay? So for a woman, that's 25 grams of fiber, and for men, that's 38 grams of fiber. I would suspect most people are a fraction of that. This is a very common thing we see on these. So going back to some just different foods to think about um, for breakfast. I said I'd mention this. So you have white toast, whole wheat toast. The carbs are the same, okay? Sugar is the same. The difference here is you get about four to five times the fiber in the whole wheat. Because again, it has that outer shell on it. Orange juice versus orange. Carbs are almost the same. Sugar, you get a lot more in the orange juice. But again, you get a lot of fiber in the, the orange that you wouldn't get otherwise. And if you compare oatmeal versus Lucky Charms, a staple of the dining services here at the event, um, you can see, again, carbs are about the same. So just looking at carbs, eh, it doesn't really tell you that much. But sugar content is way higher. And, you know, there's no fiber. I mean, this is like a sugar, you know, you could just as well eat a, uh, drink a cola for breakfast. Um, so very different. So just thinking about some basic things, you know, that we all have options every day to choose from and making uh, what I would argue would be uh, a more educated, wise decision on what to choose. So our carb intake, um, most people are eating in the range of the carbs they should be getting, like 50%, but the sugar intake is high, okay? Again, there's no formal recommendation, but generally the less the better. And added, as I mentioned, the group that's really at risk up here is, is kind of you guys and the teenagers where the, the uh, sugar sweet beverages, the sodas, the juices, the energy drinks are really, really a big, a big thing. And then, of course, the dietary fiber, most people are getting way less than that. So um, you can see a fruit, an average person gets one fruit and one whole grain serving a day, which is way, way below what we need. Okay, so I'm going to go back and talk about digestible carbohydrates a little bit. 
So what are their functions? So we know that when you eat uh, starch, when you eat sugars, various things, they provide energy. And that's the first and foremost thing they do in your body. Okay. The second is they spare protein. And I'm going to, if we get through it today, there's a question of the day that I have at the end of this um, talk that goes back to this. It gets a little bit in the metabolism of these things. But uh, just to give you a little prelude, um, most of the glucose in our bodies under right now, you guys all have breakfast, most of that glucose is coming from your diet. Okay? Um, but if you were to stop eating, the way the glucose, your body would maintain that glucose in your blood, which you absolutely need or your brain will go into a coma and die, right? Is you will convert other things in your body into that glucose. And one of those things we convert is protein. So if you don't have enough glucose in your body or not getting enough carbs in your diet, you're going to be breaking down protein. Okay? And so it spares protein. So if you're a bodybuilder trying to build muscle mass, limiting your carb intake, probably not a good idea because you're going to be kind of turning over and using your own protein for energy, essentially. Okay? And another thing um, it's going to do is prevent ketosis. Now, we haven't talked about this yet. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about it. Um, I think there's some stuff in this lecture, but for sure later on in the semester. And this is when um, you see this in diabetes. You see this when someone's fasting long term. And this really gets after kind of not having enough carbs is where you burn fat. But you're burning fat so much that you can't break it down all the way. And you get these things called ketones produced, which leads to ketosis. And these are acids, and they accumulate in the blood. And they can cause acidosis and all sorts of bad things. And so we'll talk a little bit about why that happens and how that happens um, later on. But so carbs helps prevent some of these things in your diet. So the functions of indigestible carbohydrates. The one thing I mentioned in that slide where I highlighted those little things is it prevents diver uh, diverticulosis. And what that is basically is if you look at your colon here, or your, your, sorry, your small intestine, it's all of these little um, protrusions, you could almost call them polyps, okay? And these are abnormal growths, essentially, in your gut. And this can lead to, um, can lead to cancer, it can lead to all sorts of intestinal dysfunction things, all right? So having that bulk of the indigestible fiber there is an important signal. Maybe it's a stretch thing, I don't, I mean, we're not exactly sure, but it's really important for your gut health, okay? Uh, we know uh, they can reduce obesity risk, and this is probably more of a fill factor than anything. They fill, take up space, fill up your gut. As far as enhancing blood glucose control, again, the soluble fibers are more important. And, um, well, this, I don't know why I have water soluble and soluble. Same thing. Um, and along with the cholesterol absorption. So those just highlighting what I showed you guys in that little graphic before about some of the benefits of the soluble fibers. Lowering glucose, lowering cholesterol. So a little bit on the digestive process of carbs. So we talked about kind of the different classes, what they're doing in the body or what they're giving us. And now I need to spend just a little bit going over it, talking about how they're actually digesting. Okay? And I mentioned this earlier. Um, there's a little bit of amylase in your mouth, so it can break down some starches, but not much. Very little happens. Goes in the stomach, and really, as far as carbs are concerned, there's nothing really happens in the stomach. It's just flowing through. Okay, why am I pointing at the liver? Okay, the stomach's over here. Um, <laughs> so it goes, like God. Um, goes through the stomach, nothing's happening. Small intestine is really where all the action is. So this is where almost all the digestion and absorption happens, especially with those that are the sugars, things that are, are digestible. And again, I mentioned, uh, we talked about this in the previous chapter, the pancreas plays a big role, because the pancreas, even though it doesn't come in physical contact with the food, it dumps all of the enzymes that break down the carbs into the small intestine. So it dumps these enzymes down that break down the, sh the, you know, the sucrose, the, any of the carbs, that are, the starch, all of those things. Okay, so it still plays an important role. Small intestine is where most of these are broken down to, to their individual components, monosaccharides, and absorbed. Okay? Uh, the large intestine is where the soluble fiber is going to be metabolized. So all of your fiber is going to probably make it to the large intestine, or most of it. There are some bugs. We focus, when we talked about gut bacteria, we focus mostly on the large intestine. As you work your way back up, there still are bugs, but just less and less and less as you go up. Okay? 
Um, but most of that fiber is going to reach your lower gut, your large intestine. And there um, is where some of it's going to get fermented by the bacteria and absorbed um, the fatty acids or whatever it may be. And then obviously whatever's left goes out. And the other organ, which is really post-absorption, um, is the liver. Um, and again, all of these uh, glucose or whatever it is, this gets absorbed and it goes directly to the liver. So the liver is going to get first dibs at it. So if there's lots of glucose coming in, the liver is going to store it um, or convert it to various other things, which we'll talk more about later on. Um, as far as absorption, we talked about this. The, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. This isn't a huge thing for you guys to remember, but about the different absorption processes, active versus facilitated for these different uh, monosaccharides. And uh, the other thing, which is really, I don't think I talk about this later, maybe I should spend a little time about this, talking about um, fructose. And so when I was talking about high fructose corn syrup or sugar, remember half of that is fructose. And fructose is metabolized very, very different than glucose in your body. So if you were to compare table sugar or high fructose corn syrup versus just starch, so you eat a piece of bread or pasta versus sugar, when you eat that pasta, it all gets broken down to glucose. It goes in your body, um, blood glucose goes up, and most of that glucose gets used by your muscles, your heart, your brain, your adipose tissue, things like that, okay? Most of it bypasses the liver. Fructose, nearly 100% of it goes to your liver, just like that. The liver like sucks it up, it's like a sponge. And why this is important, because if you drink a big thing of, of soda, Almost all that fructose floods to your liver, and the liver is like, oh my god, I have so much energy, what do I do with it? And a lot, what can happen is it converts it to fat, and that's a bad thing. It can lead to fatty liver, it can lead to uh, high blood triglycerides, all sorts of things. So they're, they're metabolized very, very differently. Okay? So if you consume more glucose than needed, um, what's going to happen is, the, the first thing is, this is any time pretty much you eat glucose, is you're going to store it um, in the form, as a form of carbohydrate. So when you eat a meal, you're going to restore glucose as glycogen. Plants store it as things like starch, we store it as glycogen. This is storage form of glucose for us. And we store this primarily in two tissues. That is our liver and our muscles. So we talked a little bit about this. Okay? Again, the muscle, it's going to use for exercise later on when you don't have fuel. Okay? When you're running, you guys are a lot of carb loading, right? When you exercise. This is exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about making glycogen. So when you're doing that long term exercise, you have fuel. Glycogen is an important fuel. Um, and in the liver, the liver is going to use that glycogen to can kick it out in the blood in the best form of glucose when you haven't eaten in a very long time. And then the extra, so that's kind of like the first level, okay, you got enough glucose, we're going to store it. Then if there's a whole bunch coming in yet, your body's like, okay, we got plenty, let's make it convert it into fat for really long-term storage, okay? And this is primarily going to happen in either the um, adipose tissue or it happens in the liver as well, okay? We're not just exactly sure how much it each in, in humans. So what regulates blood glucose? Now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when it gets absorbed. Not too much, but uh, we'll spend some time on this. And we have to talk about hormones, and of course the hormone that everyone's probably most familiar with is insulin. So insulin is a hormone released by our pancreas. And it is it does a lot of things in the body beyond glucose, but its primary goal, its primary function is to control your blood glucose levels. All right? So, um, there's a lot of different hormones here. We're not going to go through all these. We're just going to focus on insulin here, okay? But just to show you what effects it has, insulin, so it's released by the pancreas, as I mentioned. It primarily targets these tissues, so muscle, adipose, and liver. And what it does is it, insulin is released in response to glucose. And I'll show you this on the graphic here in a minute. But it's essentially telling the body, hey, there's a lot of glucose around, do something with it. Use it or store it, okay? And because we know if you have glucose really high for a long time, it can be quite bad. And so insulin's gonna tell your body to use it. And so it tells tissues like muscle and adipose tissue to take the glucose up out of the blood and store it as glycogen or store it as fat. And it also tells the liver to stop making glucose, which we'll talk more about later on. So the net effect is insulin is going to lower your blood glucose. 
So let's look at a little graphic like this, okay? okay. So, so, so over here, you eat a meal. So you go to uh, the Olive Garden there for any boat house, right? That's my example. You eat a whole crap ton of starch. Your body digests it. Your glucose levels go up in your blood. There are certain cells in your pancreas that recognize glucose. Okay? They say, okay, glucose is pretty high. So in response, it releases this hormone insulin. Okay? Insulin circulates in the blood, and it basically tells these cells, like I said, muscle predominantly, about 80% of the glucose uptake in response to this goes to muscle. So that's a big one. But other tissues as well. And it tells them to take up the glucose out of the blood and convert it into glycogen, or in some cases, convert it into fat. Okay, so stores. Kind of like when you get a big you get a paycheck. Hopefully you don't vote all your stores for later on if you don't have any money, right? It's the same concept. So we don't know, um, you know, historically, evolutionary, we don't know when that next meal is coming. So we want to use what we need and then store the rest for later on. So as a result of the glucose going into these cells and being stored, your blood glucose levels go down. So again, your blood glucose goes up, insulin's released, and it comes back down, all right? and it normalizes the glucose within a pretty tight range. Now, an opposite happens too. So if you guys skip breakfast this morning, your last meal was last night, the opposite is happening. So you have low blood glucose right now. You're down at this point. And what's going to happen is another hormone is going to release called pancreas, called, 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 called glucagon. Okay? This is the uh, arch enemy of insulin. They, they do opposite things. So, so it tells your body that we don't have enough glucose, we need to make some. It's not coming from the diet. So what it does is it tells your liver to um, break down the glycogen that we just stored, like last night after your meal up here, and it tells your liver to make, uh, to undergo this process called gluconeogenesis. And what this is, is it's, it's essentially making glucose from things that aren't carbohydrates. So it's converting things like amino acids, um, um, lactate, um, other uh, nutrients into glucose, okay? So the net result is your liver is going, and these are, I should mention, it's not on here, but these are happening in your liver, okay? So the liver, the net result is the liver is going to be kicking out glucose, and that is going to go and raise your blood glucose levels. So right now your liver is making glucose if you skip breakfast to keep your glucose in a normal range so that I don't have to pick you up off the floor because you're in a coma, okay? So that's a good thing. So our body's tightly regulated, amazingly so. And we'll talk later on um, about what happens in, in um, shortly actually about diabetes. So what diabetes is really is when this system gets all screwed up. Okay, and we and lose control of this whole process. process. So some of the health concerns regarding carbohydrate intake. The first one, I, I have this in here to the people can it, but it's, it's very, very minor, very, very, very minor. Is very few people have problems with having too much fiber in their diet, okay? Um, so, so I, I'm not going to ask you on this, but there are some very health conscious people that eat 50 to 60 grams of fiber a day, which um, can actually, even though fiber keeps you regular, there is a limit, right? You can reach so much where, you know, if you eat five pounds of celery a day, it's going to have consequences. Um, it can also um, affect mineral absorption, kind of a minor point. But again, how common is It's not very. This is, this is, I'm pretty sure most doctors or dietitians don't have to worry about most people coming in and saying, I'm eating too much fiber. The one uh, that is more concerning, and again, this one we talked about, is the high sugar diet really being a catalyst to drive the obesity epidemic um, and all the metabolic diseases. There's more and more studies coming out showing high sugar intake linked to cardiovascular disease, to cancer, to diabetes, all of these things. And so this is a concern. And the other thing along with this, it's not just the more metabolic stuff, but also um, the more sugar you eat, the more cavities you get. Okay? So is there any great pre-dentist in here? Obviously, hopefully this is, this is um, obvious to you guys. To you guys. Another one related to carbohydrate is, is lactose intolerance. And we, we talked a little bit about this. This is pretty common, especially in some ethnic groups. Um, and this is the, the main reason of this, is for most people, is they, don't, they lack the enzyme or have very little of the enzyme lactase, which breaks down into sugar, lactose. Okay? So as a result, when you drink milk, 
that lactose gets in, gets in, and, gets in and you can't digest it, it makes it to the gut bacteria, and then you have a hay with it, make gas, gas, do all sorts of bad things. Now, you can also get this from certain other diseases, Crohn's disease or other things, where there's so much inflammation in the gut that it can actually damage the production of this enzyme. This, um, not as common as a primary, but it can still happen. Um, another one, another one, I don't I use this term very often, but it's called glucose, glucose intolerance. It's, it's, it's basically your um, loss of control of glucose, glucose, glucose in a type of range. And I, this is really this is more the, um, related to diabetes. diabetes. So this is this hypoglycemia, which means low, low blood glucose. glucose. I should, I should, in case you guys aren't familiar with these terms here. here. Hypo, Hypo, which is a term which you might use, use low. low. So, so blood, blood glucose lower than normal, than normal range. range. And hyper, hyper means high. high. So above so the normal range. Because both can have pretty negative consequences on the body. You want to keep your glucose pretty tight. Okay, so, so, so we're going to talk about diabetes, diabetes a little bit. So we start off, there's, there's two, two flavors of diabetes, okay? okay? There's type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is, is the, the um, uh, lesser common. Lesser common. So, type so type 1 accounts for maybe 5 to 10% of all of diabetes. Of all diabetes. Okay? And, okay, and this, this is the one where, where um, I don't think I have, I have it on the slides, slides here, but um, um, this is the this one is we call uh, early onset for juvenile diabetes. This is the one that happens to kids primarily. Okay, generally you see a diagnosis from, I don't know, maybe age 5 to 15, somewhere in that range. Um, and what happens, the, the two diabetes I'm talking about are very different, okay? okay? As far as how they develop and what causes them. And I know, I remember reading the cards, there's several people that are type 1 diabetics in here. Um, and what happens is, we talked about the pancreas, and the pancreas produces insulin. It's got these cells, cell beta cells in the, in the pancreas that sense the glucose and release insulin. And what happens is that your immune system, which is, should be there to protect us, actually recognizes those cells as something foreign, and they attack them and kill them. Okay? So we call this an autoimmune disease. It's when our immune systems turn against us. We talked about this in some of the intestinal uh, inflammatory diseases as well, or rheumatoid arthritis, all sorts of things. Um, and so, and so as a result, as a result you, you basically lose, lose your ability to produce insulin. insulin. So when you eat a meal, there's no regulation, there's no regulation of glucose. glucose. It just comes it just in. in. There's no there's signal to your cells to take it up and use it. it. And this is, a, this is an obviously a big issue. issue. Some of these people come in with crazy high levels of glucose. And so the way we treat this um, are through multiple, typically insulin is given. Um, the standard or the old school way is the insulin shots, shots, okay, which is a very unpleasant way. And it's also, it's usually long term kind of long acting insulin. So it's, so it's, it's, it's better than nothing, but there's still a lot of error. More recently, um, there have been these pumps that are installed that actually sense in more real time your blood glucose levels and kind of adjust insulin accordingly, which has improved the field a lot. Um, there's also actually the UFM is really great. Um, it's the Schultz Diabetes Center for type 1 diabetes. It's really phenomenal. And they do um, um, what we call islet transplants. So in the pancreas, there's, there's these groups of cells, these beta cells, or what we call an um, islet. Um, and um, um, what they do is they, they go into a donor, somebody that's in a car or something like that. They get these, they get these cells, cells out, and they actually they inject, inject them, them, and they actually, they, actually, they, they can't they replace can't the whole pancreas. They can, but it's very difficult. Um, um, they actually they inject, inject them into someone, and they set up camp in the liver. They inject the cells in, they set up camp in the liver, and they start producing insulin. So that's what an eyelid transplant is. And this, for a lot of people, can really keep your glucose under control. So that so is an that option is as well. There's well, more and more modern monitors coming out. Pump, pump, pump is really where uh, uh, a lot of it lot is going. Is going. And these, uh, for, for most people, this people, is fairly effective, but there's still a lot of, lot of you, you got to be careful with your diet and various other things, okay? okay. So obviously, so I mentioned that here. Keeping your monitor, keeping an eye on how much carbohydrate you're eating. So if you have type 1 diabetes, we know that this is a risk for a lot of other things. There are a lot of complications with this disease. Because again, if you get that glucose really high or really low, it can, it can, it can have um, uh, ramifications, especially on the heart, um, kidney, blindness is a big complication, amputation, all sorts of things.
So that's type, so that's one. type one. So type so two, two is, is really uh, uh, completely different. So this is more of a, a, we call it an adult, adult onset, onset diabetes. diabetes. And, and what, what happens, happens here is, is, is your body, your body becomes, becomes resistant, resistant to insulin. insulin. So type so one is one that don't have insulin in there. Okay? Okay. Um, um, your body is still sensitive to it, but it's not there. So this one, so what, what happens, happens, happens is, is insulin is released, released but your body, your body can't, can't. It doesn't it respond to it. So as a result, it's more and more insulin is released to be able to tell the body to use that glucose. And this results in a hyper so you high levels of insulin, and the glucose can stay high. And, and what's driving what's driving what, what really happens over time, time is, 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 and we're talking time, we're talking years, years here, here, is this, is this these cells in the pancreas keep making more and more insulin, and eventually they get burned out and die. And die. Okay? Okay. That's full-blown full type 2 diabetes. diabetes. This, resistance this resistance is really what we call more pre-diabetes, and, and then once the beta cells quit, then you're really screwed. And this is the most common one. Right now it's about... I think it's 8% of the U.S. population, population is diagnosed with, with diabetes. diabetes. There's probably There's another, another, I don't know how many million, million people that have undiagnosed diabetes. diabetes. It's, very it's very common. This, this is worldwide. worldwide. It's, this is probably this is one of the biggest, biggest growing health, health concerns worldwide. You have some places, at least some countries, where incidents are up to like 30%. And many people many think people this will be the biggest health burden in 2034 years. Anything will be type 2 diabetes. Why is that? Is that it's really, really driven by, by, by the obesity epidemic? So obesity is a great way to increase your risk for diabetes. You can, get, you can get this if you're, if you're skinny, 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 but it's but much it's more common. Okay? That's, that's usually that's due to genetic genetics or something like that. Like that. But usually, but usually being, being overweight or, or um, um, obese, obese, obese is really what's driving this. So what do you do to treat it? Treat it. Or prevent it. Is die. It's a huge factor in this. Okay. Okay. Again, getting Again, sugars out of your diet, eating a healthy diet, 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 diet fiber, 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 all of those all things that reduce, reduce sugar, sugar increases, increases, kind of all the same common, common sense, sense things that we hit over and over this semester. semester. So diets and diets, 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 diets important. Exercise, exercise is a huge one. Huge one. Exercise, exercise has amazing, amazing effects on sensitizing your body to insulin. So even, I mean, you won't hear me say this very often, I think diet is very important. If you need a crappy diet, diet, exercise routinely, it can really, really keep a disease like this away. Just a testament to how important exercise is. And then, and then um, um, usually, usually, so I have many so friends that are endocrinologists, they, they treat they people with diabetes. diabetes. And the first, and the first thing they would do, they would say, okay, 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 your diet size, change it, change it, exercise, exercise. How many people do that? Very few, very few. Okay, okay. Unfortunately. unfortunately. So, so they, they um, have to turn to medication. medications. And, and those, those medications, medications um, um, there are a variety of them. Some of them, some of them make the body more sensitive to insulin. insulin. Um, some, um, are some are actually insulin in some late stage diabetes. Various things. But this is the primary way that, unfortunately, type 2 diabetes is treated for us. Even though there are a lot of studies showing that diet exercise. And again, we're doing studies looking at gut bacteria can change this, all sorts of things. So there's potentially other avenues that happen. But we are a drug society. So that is what we do. So, so back to the back glucose and glucose and this is kind of what happens with diabetic here. Is, is, is just to give you an idea, idea. Like a normal person, normal person when you give, you give, so it says glucose, glucose given, given. So, but so you can think of this as a meal as well. As well. So, so any so meal you provide, it's in it. Your glucose is going to go up. What's going to happen here is your insulin is released, and the insulin is going to tell your body to take up the glucose, and as a result, your glucose goes down. Back to normal rate in a couple of hours. This is a normal response. If you're a diabetic, diabetic, first of all, first of all your glucose is going to be starting higher, higher, higher. Okay? Okay. and then your and response is going to go up, go up no signal, no signal for those cells, those cells to take up the glucose. glucose. So it just kind of hovers really, really high, high, high here. And this has, has, has really bad really consequences, consequences on all sorts of things, things in your body. Your body. And this, and this basically what's the you, you, the, the, uh, We can do these tests too. If anybody is, I know a few people have kids. Those had kids and get pregnant, pregnant. You have to go in and drink like this bottle of bottle of nasty, nasty glucose stuff, right? Right. And basically, and basically this is test is totally called gestational diabetes. diabetes. So something, so something like, this, like this, kind of, it's not it's permanent, but something like this can happen when you're pregnant. Pregnant. And um, um, what they do is they they make you drink 
this, and then they take the blood, blood sample somewhere, somewhere in an hour or two, or two and make sure that your glucose level is high. Is they have to tailor your diet and all sorts of things for yourself, yourself, and the baby's potential health. So, so these are the, the trends. trends. I only go to 2008, 2008 but they're, 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 as you can see, see um, um, diabetes, diabetes is up here. Is up here. And so if we so look, 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 the lighter colors are percent 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 back in 94. Um, and as you go from 94, you can see the color is coming darker and darker and darker. And, darker. and so now so we have, we have um, what is what commonly referred to as a heart attack belt down here. Down here. Um, you can also call it a diabetes belt. Uh, more than uh, nine in some states are close to 10 or 11 percent of the population is diagnosed with diabetes. diabetes. And, and the reason I put down here is obesity, obesity is because if you look at it, at it, for the most, the most part, part, they kind of track the same. Okay? Okay. So, so just as a just testament, as a testament that, that the, the rise of obesity, obesity, obesity is probably the single biggest factor of what's driving this. I always like to I show this because, because all of the all other states are like, like, like have higher and higher than us. And Minnesota's, Minnesota's like this vast, vast, vast health. Yeah, not, not exactly. Like, no, 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 less than 25 percent of people in these places. But um, um, still, it's very, very, very. Colorado is always like the exception. Exception. So why is why is this? This always puzzles puzzles people. I think I think it's a multiple things. I think I think. Everybody, I know that I know that most Colorado is kind of like a hike and hike, physical, you know, it's beautiful, 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 yeah, we can, yeah, we can keep going here. So, here. so the one thing the one I think about type 2 diabetes is, is, is the adult onset one, 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 right? right? Most, Most historically, people, people don't give this until they're much older. Much older. I, saw, uh, I saw a couple weeks ago, weeks I think it was in the UK, UK hey, maybe it was in the US. US. There was a kid who diagnosed with type 2 diabetes that was three. Three years old. It's the youngest one ever recorded. And again, this is, this, of course, the three-year-old was quite obese. Um, um, and this is a this big is concern. Not only do we see, see more diabetes, we're seeing it happen younger, 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 younger children. children. Almost, almost the point where, where, where you know, it's, it's, it's almost, almost, almost the incident is almost as the type of one young, young kids. 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 Um, um, now, now, one of the interesting things about diabetes is you look across the whole demographics, we're not, our risks are not the same. the same. Okay. So ethnic background, genetic background has a big influence on this. We know minorities are big, very big. So we know, we know um, um, African Americans. Americans we know, we know, know um, 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 people of Hispanic descent, descent um, are especially, especially at risk. risk. And to give and you guys an idea, idea of this, of this um, and it kind of goes, goes back, back with this back concept, back concept of genetics, genetics and diet and interaction. And interaction. Okay, and we talked about this, about this right? how we're all genetically, all genetically different, different, different and our diets differently. And this is really the hallmark study. So these are these are Pima Indians. So Pima so Indians, Indians, Indians are native, are native to Mexico. Mexico. Okay. Okay. And if you go to, and if you go to, to, um, um, and, and you go to Mexico, 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 right here, right, right here, here, Pima Indians, Indians, Indians. there, there, uh, uh, prevalence of diabetes, diabetes in men and women, and women, 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 women is between 5.6 and 8.5%. If you look at you look non Pima Mexicans, it's, it's, I don't know why it's not zero here, but it's low. It's low. It's fairly comparable. Okay. Okay. Now, now um, some time ago, time ago, a bunch of uh, uh, Pima Indian migrated into the U.S. It's not really hurting the hundreds and hundreds, I believe. Okay? Okay. If you look, if you at, look at that population, population today, today, those living in the U.S., in the US their incidence of diabetes, diabetes is almost 40 percent. Type 2 diabetes. 40 percent. This is, this I don't know how many population that is this high diabetes. Why is Why is this? Did their genetics, Did genetics change, change in, in a few decades? decades? No. No. Okay? Okay. What it is, what it is, is, is these guys, these guys because of their genetic, genetic background, background, in this, in this environment, environment, okay, so it's okay. a genetic so body environment, 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 diet, diet interaction, interaction here, makes them make them both to diabetes. diabetes. So if, so if you're a few in Mexico, Mexico eating, eating uh, a normal, uh, normal, whatever their normal their traditional, traditional diet is, is, is the incidence of diabetes, diabetes, diabetes is low. low. But if you move to the U.S., US your chance of getting diabetes, diabetes goes up to 5, 5, 6, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7
Hey, it's not it's just not genetics. It's not just not diet. diet. It's the convergence of these two. two. And the same, the same thing. I mean, obviously, there's, there's a lot of factors back to the African American American population back in Africa. Africa. There's a lot of factors that are not very involved, but, but, but the incidence of diabetes there, 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 there is much, much lower than it is here, for example. Okay. So, yeah. it's so it's again, it's an environment, environment by, by, by genetic, genetic background. background. So, so um, some other blood sugar disorders. This one is this kind of a catch-all. Catch all. Maybe, maybe, maybe this, sort of this. It's called metabolic, metabolic syndrome. syndrome. This is this really, really, um, um, I would call it, call it a pre-diabetes pre state. state. So, so it says a group of factors. Factor. This is a basically a high, high, high blood triglycerides. It's, 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 it's high waste transfers. transfers it's, or, um, it's, it's uh, uh, um, what else is there? Inflammation. There's a variety of factors, factors that contribute. It's, it's basically all things all things going on halfway. halfway. And this is kind this of a catch-all that tries to tie in the anxiety diet part of that. There's also also hyperglycemia. We briefly mentioned this. But, but some, some people, people um, can get this under just normal, normal routine. routine. I think I, I think have had times. Where you, have you, you haven't eaten, 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 or you, or you maybe eaten, exercise is not as important. You're going to kill yourself, 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 yourself get in and get in. Shaky, shaky, easy, easy. You feel your blood glucose dropping, dropping. Some people are more sensitive than others. Some people have never experienced this. Some do, some do. Okay, so it's kind of, it's kind of, some can be good, it's not a response, or not enough response, whatever it may be. And so, and so, you can, you can you feel can this, feel this, uh, this uh, high glycemia. Um, um, the next thing we're going to talk about, about, which I think I'm going to have, I'll pick up this next, because this will spend a lot of time, 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 time,